Thanks, Sophie. You're watching Southeast today. Our top story tonight. The ULEZ criminal campaign continues with vandals targeting more cameras in Kent than anywhere else. I'm not into like activism and vandalisation or anything like that, but Mr Khan isn't listening. Police investigate after a young boy dies following an incident in Gravesend. We'll report on the latest developments. Brighton. And now it's Brighton. Preparing to fly in Europe, the Seagulls find out who they'll face in their first season in the Europa League. It's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. And comedian Rory Bremner comes to Canterbury in a play of one of the most controversial quiz scandals of all time. Hello, ULEZ camera vandals have hit more equipment on the Kent border of London than anywhere else, with over 100 cameras in Bromley missing or damaged. Figures released by the Metropolitan Police say at least a quarter of all new ULEZ cameras have been targeted in areas bordering the capital. Today's figures come as the BBC spoke to some vandals who say they'll continue a campaign of criminal damage as long as cameras remain, as Piers Hopkirk reports. They're the all-seeing enforcers of London's ultra-low emission zone. But since the so-called ULEZ was expanded on Tuesday to cover all 32 London boroughs, the scale of malicious attacks has been laid bare. Between April the 1st and August the 31st, the Metropolitan Police recorded 510 crimes relating to ULEZ cameras. This includes approximately 159 reports of cameras being stolen and 351 cameras being damaged. On the Kent border, the dividing line of the newly expanded zone now runs between Dartford and Crayford. I don't believe in vandalism, so don't get me wrong, but I, I don't blame them. I'll be quite honest with you. I really don't. I really don't. And that just proves that how angry people are. It's the only way we're going to get heard. As I said, I don't know anybody that's done it. I certainly haven't been out there myself doing it. There's no way I would go out of my way and spray a paint them and everything, because if you do it, you're going to get caught by other cameras anyway, so you, you ain't going to avoid it. With owners of higher polluting vehicles now having to pay £12.50 a day to drive in London, the ULEZ scheme continues to polarise opinion. I think that we've got a big problem in terms of climate change. We need to put a whole measure of packages in and this is just part of a much bigger picture. I've just found the whole thing a complete confusion. Nobody quite knows which expert to believe. We'll probably all get over it eventually, but it's just going to take some time. If we need to make changes, it's going to have to happen, right? So it was inevitable. Health campaigners, though, say it's vital. Uh, I think we need to recognise that London has taken a big and important step forward this week towards being a cleaner, quieter and healthier city. Uh, and the evidence certainly is that previous phases have worked and re resulted in really large reductions in nitrogen dioxide at roadsides. And that's what this scheme targets. ULEZ has more than 3,400 cameras. More are set to be installed soon. The attacks on them have been condemned by Transport for London. They say it puts the perpetrators at risk while simultaneously risking the safety of the public. Vandals, they insist, will not halt the scheme. And uh, Piers Hopkirk joins us now for more on this. Piers, looking at the scale of these attacks, could it almost be called a sort of campaign of civil disobedience? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think those words are, are properly apposite. Whether or not there's been a kind of degree of coordination in it, though, I think is much more difficult to say. What is clear, though, is that in August there has been a huge spike in attacks on these cameras. So between April and August there had been 288. By the end of August, that had rocketed to 510. Now, that said, the BBC has spoken to someone from a group claiming to be part of a, a, a group carrying out coordinated attacks, a group who they call the Blade Runners. And when we put it to him that actually those actions were costing the taxpayer money, this is what he said. He said, we don't care. All politicians are liars. 
we did it with the congestion charge and we're doing it with speed cameras it's just a little bit of direct action now both transport for london tfl and the metropolitan police have said that if you're caught vandalizing these cameras you will face the full force of the law Piers, thank you Police are investigating after a boy died following an incident in Gravesend. Emergency services were called to Singlewell Road on Wednesday afternoon and the boy, who's believed to be under the age of 12, was taken to hospital where he later passed away. It's unclear as to exactly what happened. Our reporter Josie Hannett is at North Fleet Police Station with more on this. Uh, Josie, what more do we know this evening? Well, Ellie, we don't have too much more detail and that's due to the sensitivity of this incident and the fact that children were involved and police say they're working to establish exactly what happened. Now, what we do know is that officers were called at 5.45 on Wednesday afternoon following the concerns for the welfare of a young boy. South East Coast Ambulance Service were also called. They took the boy to hospital where he then later died. Now, as part of this police investigation, another boy was arrested to establish all of the circumstances of this isolated incident, but he's since been released on bail pending further inquiries and we don't know what he was arrested for. We know that both of the boys were under the age of 12. Again, we don't have an exact age and we also know that no weapons were involved. Now, Kent Police Superintendent Nick Sparks told us his thoughts are with the families involved and the wider community and at this stage they're not looking to speak to anyone else in regards to this incident. Lucy, thank you. Police investigating the murder of a woman in Kent whose body was found a week ago between St Nicholas at Wade and Minnis Bay have formally confirmed her identity. 54-year-old Claire Knights was reported missing from Upstreet last Wednesday. A man in his 20s from Margate has been arrested on suspicion of murder and detained for assessment by medical professionals. Officers are not looking for anyone else in connection with the death. A man's been arrested after an 11-year-old boy was injured by a shotgun in Sussex Woodland. Police and paramedics were called to the scene between Catsfield and Ninfield just after 11 o'clock yesterday morning. The boy was with a party of adults who were rough shooting and suffered a serious wound to his hip. A 54-year-old man from Nottinghamshire was arrested at the scene on suspicion of grievous bodily harm. Two days of back-to-back -back rail strikes have begun, with the Train Drivers Union as left staging industrial action today and the RMT union walking out tomorrow. Southern says there will only be a limited service on both days, with no Gatwick Express and Thameslink trains today. Southeastern trains won't be running either, with a reduced service tomorrow. Some residents near the Sussex North Eye site, earmarked to house asylum seekers, say they're not reassured by the news. It may be a closed, secure detention centre instead of open accommodation. The MP for Bexhill and Battle, Hugh Merriman, says the change of use would be welcome as it won't affect the wider community as much. But those who live nearby say they're still worried. The Home Office says no plans have been confirmed. Our political editor, Charlotte Wright, has more. These are the buildings that were earmarked earlier this year to house 1,200 asylum-seeking men. As accommodation, residents would have been free to come and go and use facilities in the wider community. But according to the local MP, there's a new proposal to knock this down and build a new secure detention centre in its place for people who make the journey across the channel on small boats. But right on the doorstep of this site are dozens of homes and some of the residents that we've spoken to here today are still uncertain and in some cases seriously worried about what it all means. When it was a functioning prison, uh, the inmates rioted. They, uh, several of them escaped. They set fire to the place. So how is it going to be any different there? To me, I feel sorry for them. Um, you know, they're fleeing war-torn war countries and they, they've got nowhere else to go. But, I mean, I live here. If people who own their houses in this, in this area, their houses aren't worth anything. They can't sell them, they can't do anything with them. They're stuck, you know what I mean? Will that be different, though, if it's a detention centre? No, I doubt it. Earlier this summer, the government changed the law to criminalise anyone who makes the crossing. It means all those who arrive in this way are meant to be detained and deported. And with more than 20,000 arriving so far this year, the Home Office now needs to find extra detention capacity. 
The original plan to use the site for asylum accommodation was met with fury locally, but the Bexhill and Battle MP says making it a detention centre would be a positive development. All the way along I've understood the impact uh, on local residents. The chief concern was that the site would be open uh, and that led to security concerns and other uh, concerns from residents. So I was keen to work with government, inside government, to try and get those changes so it becomes a closed site. So for most people, there's no impact at all. Obviously, for those adjacent to the site, the former prison office homes, I recognise there are still concerns and I will work with them to try and mitigate those. The concept of detention sites is not welcomed, though, by some humanitarian campaigners. Putting into effect a derelict prison that hasn't been operational for three decades serves as no serious answer to simply getting on with the job of having an asylum system that functions. The Home Office say detention centres play a vital role in controlling our borders, but they won't yet confirm whether North Eye will be among them. The uncertainty continues for this community for now. Charlotte Wright, BBC South East Today, Bexhill. There were delays on the A21 southbound after a car caught fire on the Seven Oaks bypass. It happened close to the turn off of the M25 towards London. Smoke from the fire blew across the road, causing a crash on the opposite side. No injuries have been reported, and police and fire crews have left the scene. The NHS Trust that runs hospitals in Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells has been told by inspectors that it still requires improvement. The Care Quality Commission says it will continue to monitor the Trust, which has been judged as requiring improvement since 2018. Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust says it's proud of the progress that has been made, but acknowledges there is still more to do. Southern Water has announced a £1.8 million building project to cut sewage spills from a Sussex treatment works. The company says the works in Balcombe will improve water quality in the River Ouse. Untreated waste water spilled into the environment for more than 950 hours from the site last year. It's a centuries-old tradition still relevant in the modern world. The practice of gleaning is making a comeback as volunteers try to tackle the cost of living crisis by fighting food waste. Farmers have allowed people to take leftover crops after harvest for hundreds of years and now charity food banks are able to stock their shelves with foods picked for free from local growers. Claudia Sebasis has been to see how it all works. It's long been a form of welfare, collecting leftover crops to give to those in need. Stephen Wakeford runs one of the community groups helping today. We always glean to order uh, because we, we don't have storage or anything like that. So we ask our charities what they want each week. We're, we're kind of reliant on the kindness of farmers to offer things to us. And that depends on also uh, things to do with weather and uh, just how the growing season's going. They support about 25 charities in the Deal District and Thanet area. Chris Turnbull is aiming to pack 70 crates for his community in Hythe and fair share in Maidstone. We can get potatoes most weeks of the year, so we've already put those in crates. And we're now out in the fields uh, harvesting cabbages and uh, we're harvesting sweetheart cabbages, pointy cabbages, uh, which are wonderful, wonderful things. They store well uh, and you can turn them into coleslaw or eat them as a, as a cabbage veg. The practice of gleaning was actually mentioned in the Bible and by the Middle Ages it had become law and people gleaned up until the 18th century. But with modern farming methods it became more and more difficult for gleaners to glean. Volunteers see the work as rewarding and good for mental and physical health. We just love the idea of being able to do something for charity where we don't have to actually give money, we just give our time. People are so, so hard up, you know, people are real, in real food poverty and we can help that. So I think it's very important that we glean at the moment. I volunteer for the Shepway Food Bank, so I see where this stuff is going. So I see the need, I see the need growing. Once the crates are full, they're distributed around the county. These cabbages and potatoes have arrived at a social supermarket in Ramsgate called SE Kitchen. It's not a food bank, anyone can shop here. The gleaners coming is a real highlight of our week and, and we just see people's faces light up when they come in with their beautiful potatoes and cabbages because they just look so glorious and they're so healthy. 
Cheers, guys. Have a lovely day. Bless you all. It's really helpful. There's a lot of people struggling at the moment with the cost of living and everything, so um, this has been perfect for a lot of people. With demand rising, the charities are now looking for more keen gleaners. Claudia Sabazis, BBC South East Today, Ramsgate. It's uh, almost 10 to 7, a reminder of our top story tonight. ULEZ camera vandals have hit more equipment on the Kent border of London than anywhere else, with over 100 Bromley cameras missing or damaged. Vandals have told the BBC they'll continue their campaign of criminal damage as long as cameras remain. Also in tonight's programme... But we don't want to give you that... We chat to comedian Rory Bremner before he comes to Canterbury with the tale of the coughing major, one of the biggest quiz show scandals of all time. And after today's torrential downpours, there is going to be a change in our weather for this weekend. It's going to be dry, sunny and much warmer. I've got all the details later on in the programme. Now, don't forget, you can always have your say by going to Facebook, Twitter or Instagram and you can see more news and videos from across Kent, Sussex and Surrey on the BBC News website. Now to sport. Uh, Brighton and Hove Albion now know who they will face in their first season in the Europa League. The Seagulls have been drawn to face European giants AFC Ajax in Amsterdam. They then travel to the south of France where they play Marseille. And then it's across the Mediterranean to face the Greek team AEK Athens in Group B. Brighton made it through to the European competition for the first time after finishing sixth in the Premier League last season, their best ever finish. Well, James Dunn is at the Amex Stadium in Brighton for us now. Hello, James. What, what's the reaction from fans to the draw? Are they pleased? very pleased in fact now if you bear in mind that they've been waiting for months to find out who they're going to face it could have been Azerbaijan it could have been Israel it could have been Serbia and instead they've got these more familiar locations of France the Netherlands and Greece all places one fan told me that you can fly direct to from Gatwick so that's nice and convenient for them but the other big news of course coming out of here today is that they've managed to sign Ansu Fati a player from Barcelona who they consider so talented that they gave him Lionel Messi's number 10 shirt. Now it's a loan deal, there's no option to buy, presumably because Barcelona want to keep him, but it is a huge boost to a team who are looking ahead at their first ever European campaign. And earlier today I was at the Caxton Arms talking to fans about the draw after those tense moments when we found out who was going to be in the group. Brighton. <laughs> drawn to face some giants of European football. Face Ajax and the Olympique de Marseille in a very strong group, I would say. With Athens then joining the group, it's Amsterdam, the south of France and Greece ahead for the travelling seagulls. Ajax, it's just a dream club, isn't it? It's one of the absolute icons of European football. Uh, Marseille, a huge club as well. And Athens, I've not been to Athens, so looking forward to, uh, to going to those games. I'll be there, no matter if I get a ticket or not, I will 100% be there. Uh, it's such a historic moment. Um, yeah, <laughs> can't miss it, can't. You don't know if it's ever going to happen again. Right. It's a tough group, but I think when you watch Brighton regularly, we tend to play better against the better the team. So I'm very excited and I'm confident that we'll progress through to the later stages of the competition. Amsterdam, Marseille, Athens is just incredible. From where we've come from to where we're going to go in Europe is ridiculous. And within minutes of the draw, they officially announced the signing of Barcelona's Ansu Fati, a transfer deadline day loan deal that's bolstered the hopes of fans. I mean, who would have dreamt that Brighton could have had a chance of getting a player like this? I mean, it's just amazing. And we all thought it would just fall through at the last minute. So to get that confirmation today is just fantastic. Brighton's group includes Ajax, the most successful club in Dutch football. They've won the Champions League four times, that's the tier above Europa, and their stadium in Amsterdam has a 55,000 capacity. Marseille has won the Champions League in 1993 and they made the Europa League final in 2018. Their stadium, the Orange Velodrome, holds up to 67,000. AEK Athens have won 13 domestic titles in Greece. Their stadium holds 32,000, similar to Brighton's, 
and they'll face each of the three teams in their group twice, at home and away. It will be a very tough uh, uh, group, uh, but we have the enthusiasm the first time Brighton can play the Europe League. Uh, you can imagine uh, uh, what will be the our attitude, behaviour and passion to, to make points and to, to qualify for the, the next step. It's a tough task ahead in Brighton's first European campaign, but the fans and the manager seem confident the Seagulls can fly further than ever before. Well, although we do know the match dates at the moment in the groups, we don't yet know which team will play which team and whether that fixture will be home or away. So people will have to wait until they book their travel. We should find that out over the next 24 hours. In the meantime, Brighton welcome a very tough Newcastle United side here tomorrow in the Premier League. Now, the manager did say today that Ansu Fati won't get his debut, so people will still have to wait to see him play. Also in League Two, we've got Crawley in action away at Stockport and Gillingham are away against Grimsby Town. Now I did mention it is of course transfer deadline day where anything could happen. Now Roberto De Zerbi did say earlier that they are complete now, they're not expecting any new business to be done between now and then but hey you never know what can happen and there could still be some last minute drama on transfer deadline day. How very exciting today has been, thank you very much James. Now, Rory Bremner is, of course, one of the nation's leading comedians known for his political satire and uncanny impressions of public figures. Providing voices for spitting image in the 1980s, he then went on to form an award-winning partnership with satirists John Bird and John Fortune. His latest impersonation, Chris Tarrant, in a new play telling the story of a coughing major scandal which engulfed the quiz show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? It has a week-long run at Canterbury's Marlowe Theatre in November and Louisa Pilbeam has been speaking to him. It's worth a million. I'm not sure. However. <laughs> it's the prime time ITV quiz show that thrills audiences with nail biting tension. But the story of one contestant convicted of cheating to win the £1 million top prize no was even more dramatic than Who Wants to Be a Millionaire itself. You just won one million. Now the appearance of Charles Ingram on the show, who has always denied the deception back in 2001, is being brought to the stage with impressionist Rory Bremner taking on host Chris Tarrant. We don't want to give you that. I've known Chris for years, actually, but he, he, the, great, the great thing is he hates my impression of him because he, he, I go tee. OK, so he, he says, I never go tee. He, I have never done that in my life so there's another reason to do it the fact that he hates it um, I love Chris uses his hands it's always you know when he's thinking okay final answer and those sort of things and so you just build and build and build you're listening to today on radio 4 with me John Humphreys in the studio and me Brian Redhead in my bedroom for being naughty <laughs> It's a new role for Bremner, who has been making the nation laugh with impressions of British public figures for more than 30 years. I mean, it's a great story. I mean, it captured people's imagination, as did Millionaire, because you know, millions of people watched it and millions of people remember this extraordinary moment. And you know, it's dramatic in itself, because not only the, the game show, which is trem tremendously dramatic, but also the courtroom that followed. So it makes for great theatre. We have a top prize of one million pounds. It's multiple choice, which has never been done before. It isn't the first time the events have been dramatised. This ITV drama with British actor Matthew McFadden as Ingram and actor Lewis Reeves now taking on the challenge. He was presented as this bumbling like army major, which as I'm, if I'm honest, I probably had that opinion myself, but as I'm going through the rehearsal process, I'm realising that this was, you know, an army general who commanded 144 men. He, he, was, he was a member of Mensa as well. He was a sufficiently intelligent bloke and he had a bit of steel to him. Who had a hit UK album with Born To Do It released in 2000? The audience get the chance to vote through the show about whether they think the Ingrams cheated. Some will be 50-50, others right may need to phone a friend. <laughs> Louisa yeah. Poolbeam, BBC South East Today. <laughs> <laughs> nice, that looks like a lot of fun. Time now for the weather forecast. Nina Ridge is with us and another reason to smile today, Nina. 
I know, the weather has made us wait for some settled conditions, but finally, we may be into September, but high pressure is on its way. Today, we started off with a lot of cloud. There were some heavy showers around, and across parts of East and North Kent, they really have lasted. There is still one or two around, one particularly close, close to Gravesend at the moment, but I think there was some sunshine for some of us as we went through the afternoon, and it felt pretty warm. That is certainly signs of things to come. So we're losing the low pressure that brought the showers through the day today. The high is building in through the weekend. And in fact, not just for the weekend, potentially staying around for much of next week as well. So the weekend forecast may just bring some early morning mist and fog with those light winds, but we will see some warm sunshine around. The showers this evening are clearing away and then overnight tonight it is going to be dry with those light winds, some patches of mist and fog forming and temperatures will start tomorrow at around 10 or 11 degrees. So we've got this early morning mist and fog to clear. It may just take its time but it will do so through the morning. Things brightening up and for most of us it will be a dry day on Saturday but there is just the very low chance of a shower. They're pretty well scattered and temperatures slightly higher than today. We're looking at top temperatures tomorrow of around 22 to 23 degrees. So we'll have a dry evening and then as we go into a Sunday morning again that mixture of clear skies, light winds means there is always the potential for the mist and fog to make a return and temperatures on Sunday morning will start at around 12 to 13 degrees. So once again we've got the mist and fog just to clear through Sunday morning but then things brighten up into the afternoon plenty of sunshine and the warmth starting to build. I think for a lot of us we're looking at temperatures around about 23 degrees. We could see a 24 or 25 on Sunday afternoon. So with that high pressure becomes a lot more sunshine again. There could always be that mist in the mornings but we've got those light winds and as the week goes on the winds start to turn more to a southerly direction so that starts to pick up some slightly warmer air as well. So not only settled, dry, warm, and sunny but also things turning warmer. So as I mentioned the showers that we've had today are generally going to clear. We might just pick up one or two through Saturday afternoon. A little more cloud around then with that high pressure building in lots of sunshine in the outlook. At the moment that high pressure should last throughout next week. No changes until next weekend and we might just start to see those temperatures creeping up into the high 20s Ellie. Just in time for the children to go back to school. Brilliant. We could have done with this in August. Thank you very much, Nina. That's it from me and the rest of the team. Miranda Shunker will be back with your late news update at 10.30. Bye-bye.